but um, I'm really excited to be here with two um, guests, both of whom are coming to us from different places in the US. And in some ways this is sort of a reunion for a little workshop that we were had organized um, right on the 13th of March and the day before that was going to take place. So this was a workshop on similar topics kind of in a broader perspective on the kind of nexus of racial inequality, medicine, healthcare, medical racism. Um, and so Yolanda and Corey, whom I'll introduce more formally in a moment, had traveled to Toronto arriving on the 12th and that evening, a few hours after they both arrived, the University of Toronto gave its um, first kind of official shutdown order to cancel all non-essential events initially. So um, we, were, we were called off like right at the last minute. Um, we were able to have breakfast together um, at a time when it was still sort of normal to, to meet in person in, in a admittedly empty restaurant. Um, and we got to chat for a couple hours and we're really excited about each other's work. And so when the Center for Ethics started doing this Ethics of COVID series virtually, um, we thought it would be a fun idea to get together and talk about some of the things that we've been thinking about already to do with race and medicine, but then also to try to draw some admittedly tentative connections to COVID. Um, and, you know, of course, um, none of us are epidemiologists or doctors. Um, two of us are trained in philosophy, Yolanda and I, Corey is a historian. Um, and so the sorts of reflections that we're going to be giving today are, you know, not kind of um, trying to draw kind of firm epidemiological or kind of public policy conclusions, um, especially, you know, I think in general, there's a degree of caution that's required in the early stages. Um, and, you know, but I do think that it is, um, you know, high time to start talking about some of the political, social, ethical implications of the pandemic. And then also looking at the broader historical, cultural, social, and medical context in which it's playing out and particularly in the United States. So, you know, of course there's been some surprising um, patterns that we've seen about how the pandemic is unfolding medically and some kind of oddities. I mean, one that comes to mind is the fact that like smokers seem to be underrepresented among the, the pandemic patients. I mean, I think one thing that's not surprising is the way in which race has played out in the American context in the pandemic. And so, you know, what we've seen is um, how the um, people who are most affected um, tend to fall into precisely the um, racial demographics in the US who traditionally have the least access to healthcare and have been subject to longstanding medical discrimination. So for example, in New York City, which is the epicenter of the pandemic, um, there have been reported death rates of African-Americans um, at about double the rate of white New Yorkers and Latinos um, in New York at about one and a half, um, a little over one and a half times the rate of white New Yorkers. Um, in less large numbers, given the kind of way in which New York has had these outsized numbers, there have been um, a number of particularly severe local outbreaks on um, in Native American communities and reservations across the country. I read a report this morning that the Navajo Nation in the Southwest um, surpassed, just surpassed New York um, for the highest per capita rate of infection in the country. And so none of this is surprising even as it's very pressing. So these are precisely the sorts of patterns that one sees, you know, albeit with kind of like modifications, permutations for geography, for class, for historical epoch, that one sees really across the contemporary US in a pretty broad um, trans-historical context. Um, and so, you know, even though this, the numbers that we're seeing are unprecedented, the sorts of disparities and indeed inequalities um, are not surprising even as they're deadly and horrifying. So I think it's really important that even 
you know, as medical experts figure out what is to be done and what effective responses look like, um, that kind of a more humanistic approach starts looking at these kind of more theoretical, um, philosophical and historical questions. Um, so with that in mind, I'm just gonna stop there with that introductory spiel. I'm sure none of this is new to many of the listeners and say a brief word about um, the two um, other other people who should be on, on your screens. Um, so I'm a postdoc at the Center for Ethics at U of T. My work is, in my, my background is in philosophy and I work both in ancient philosophy and then also in philosophy of race, particularly looking at a kind of historically informed nexus of race and medicine. Um, going just alphabetically, Corey Garibaldi is assistant professor in the Department of American Studies at the University of Notre Dame in South Bend, Indiana, um, where he studies the social and intellectual history of the United States um, with a special interest in late 19th and 20th century literary production. Um, and he's been writing a book on kind of narratives of integration um, in literature. And part of that is involves looking at the cultural history um, from both a literary and broader cultural perspective of race and medicine um, in the 20th century and actually really going back, if I'm correct, into the 19th century. That's Corey. And then Yolanda Yvette Wilson is a 2019-2020 fellow at the National Humanities Center in North Carolina and a 2019-20 Encore Public Voices Fellow. She's an assistant professor of philosophy at Howard University in Washington, DC. And her research interests include bioethics, social and political philosophy, race theory, and feminist philosophy. She's broadly interested in the nature and limits of the state's obligations to rectify historic and continuing injustice, particularly in the realm of healthcare and developing an account of justice that articulates specific requirements for racial justice and healthcare at the end of life and Yolanda's work, um, we've just met in person, but her writing has been really, um, I think an important intervention and like both really kind of helpful in my own thinking, but also in the field and kind of thinking about um, bringing in questions of race, racism and racial inequality into the kind of academic philosophical subdiscipline of bioethics. And some of those kind of articles I think really have this, um, reorienting, reorienting for us. So anyway, I'm really excited to have both of you with uh, me at a distance. And basically, so the way this is gonna work is that each of us is gonna talk for 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and so we're gonna go Yolanda, myself, and then Corey um, for no particular reason, but it kind of moves from philosophy into history, I guess. And then we're going to move into a more kind of unstructured discussion between the three of us, but also I really hope um, with some participation from you, whoever you are that are viewing. Um, and so of course this is being streamed live on YouTube. So it's not gonna be like a Zoom audience participation function, but there's like a live comment stream um, on the bottom of the YouTube video. And if you have a question, a comment, a concern, you'd like to kind of like pose something about what we've said or kind of like prompt to kind of like look at something else, um, I really encourage you to um, make a note of that. And so I'll be checking um, the YouTube stream and hopefully we can get some um, some kind of like feedback and construction from, from the viewers. Okay, so I think that's all I'll remind, I'll, I'll say that again um, when we move into that second half. Um, and for now, I guess I'll invite uh, Yolanda Wilson to, to talk for a while. So thank you so much, um, Elena, for organizing us and bringing us back together, even after we couldn't come together in person on March 13th. And uh, thank you, Marcus, for the format. And I look forward to having our kind of rich discussion that we've kind of had a couple since we since we finally met in person. So Corey, I'm just glad that the three of us can come together. As I kind of noted when Elena and Corey and I were chatting earlier this week, um, the two of them are the last people that I actually had a sit down meal in a restaurant with. And, you know, it's, it's really interesting that that has been the kind of change that has happened in, in all of our lives, but, but this feels full circle in a different kind of way for that reason. So I'm going to read a few remarks. I'll talk a little bit. I'll read a little bit because I'm sure no one just wants to hear me read for 10 or 15 minutes, but um, 
I, I wrote some things down just to kind of keep myself organized. So I know that things function a, a bit differently in Canada and I'm imagining that a good chunk of the audience is, is watching from Canada or has some connection with Toronto in particular. Um, and, and, and so I just wanted to kind of put a pin in that. So most of what I'll have to say is uh, centers in, in the US, particularly with regard to healthcare, health systems, data gathering, et cetera. So, so I just wanna kind of put that caveat there from the beginning. So when it first became clear that COVID-19 was going to hit the US hard, Right. You know, because initially I think some of the conversation was, oh, it'll just be like a bad flu season. And, and I think it became clear that that's not where we were going to be with COVID-19. So a lot of scholars in public health, epidemiology, medical sociology and the like, and also others who work broadly in race and racism and health disparities were particularly interested in how the numbers were shaking out in terms of who was contracting the virus, who was getting the sickest. And, and who was dying. So this is important information to have for a lot of reasons, including kind of research and, inter and other kinds of interventions, including developing a useful public health response, right? Um, in addition to maybe vaccine development, other kind of resource allocation, and also thinking long-term, right? Thinking about funding for hospitals and clinics and also thinking about um, public health messaging for the future. So, so there are just kind of important reasons that we want to be, we need to be clear about the numbers for kind of research and intervention reasons. Okay, so to broaden this lens a little bit, right? So we wanna be clear about the number for those reasons. To broaden this lens a little bit, we also know that health status is at least partially socially determined, right? So those of us who, who do this work know that um, where you live, what kind of work you do, whether you have access to a grocery store, for instance, all of those things make a difference in how healthy one is or in one's life chances to be healthy. All of those things matter. How much we know it's not insignificant, right? So if you're gonna have a complete picture and if you're gonna draw meaningful conclusions about COVID-19 and, and specifically the impact of COVID-19 on, on race and racism, all of this information, not just who's sick and dying right by the numbers, but also where the sick and dying live and work and under what conditions the sick, the sickest and the dying are living and working, right? All of these things have to form part of a complete narrative. But a curious thing happened once we started seeing the numbers. So actually, this wasn't curious for those of us who work in race and racism, but for a lot of people, this was curious, right? Um, in fact, a lot of people predicted it, right? People who, who, um, who do this kind of work in racial health disparities predicted it. So as the numbers revealed that those who were Black and or Latinx, and then later, um, as Elena pointed out, Native American, right? We start, we're starting to see those numbers over the last um, month or so just really skyrocket, right? As, as the numbers reveal that those were the groups of people who were disproportionately affected, the public response, particularly among whites, began to shift. So the language of crisis began to be replaced with the language of personal responsibility. The idea that we, were in this together and needed to do things like stay home, you know, limit all non-essential travel or wear masks for the sake of everyone, especially those who were most vulnerable, became an infringement on freedom. So I think what I'm gonna talk about a little bit is the notion of what I'm calling the public we and what this public we entails. So I'm not, a, I'm not a philosopher of language, I'm not a linguist, right? So I'm, I'm not gonna dive deeply in that, in those waters. But, but I'll just say, right, the pronoun we is both inclusive and obscuring. If you don't listen too carefully, or if you don't think too hard about it, the, ca you know, the casual observer can feel included in the group that we delineates. At the same time, the use of the word we can obscure um, exclusion and it can obscure what those real relationships and interactions actually look like, particularly power relations. So if you think about uh, my favorite example when I, when I think about this thing is the royal we, right? 
we planted the garden last summer. Okay, Queen Victoria was not out there with the rest of us, you know, hoeing and pulling weeds. But right, so this, so this idea of we, even in our common parlance, um, there seems to be an, an understanding that at least in some instances, um, we doesn't mean everybody. So what does this public we, as I'm calling it, have to do with COVID and race? Well, with the realization that Black, Latinx, and Native American people and communities have been proportionally, at least, hit the hardest, one interpretation that has emerged is that COVID-19 has revealed and exacerbated the inequities that were already present in society. You know, I, I think that was only a revelation for those who are blissfully or willfully ignorant about how racism manifests in the U.S., but I'll uh, but I'll just set that aside. But at least, but it, but so what I want to do is just push this interpretation a little bit further. I think what we're seeing there, I am using we. What I'm seeing at least is a manifestation of the public we, and a more explicit recognition that at least in some realms, in most realms, the public we doesn't include everyone. So how do I mean this? Well, I want to think about, and, and this is kind of Elena's area a little bit uh, with the ancients, but, but the ancient Greeks had this notion of the polis, right? And, and the polis is, is largely delineated with geographic boundaries, right? It, it's literally kind of marks the city-state um, and, and what's outside the city-state. So in the city-state, in the polis, is where the business of governing happens. This is where the deliberation about the public good happens. This is where public obligations to one another are hashed out. But the Greeks are very clear, right? The mere fact of being a human who lived, worked, moved, or otherwise existed within the geographic confines of the city-state did not necessarily make one a member of the polis. And so the most famous kind of examples of, of people who were in but not of the polis were women, and or slaves, right? So, so the deliberations, the obligations, the privileges that were negotiated within the polis among its members only included consideration of others insofar as what happened to the others affected the lives, privileges, and habits of the polis. So from this standpoint, it's less surprising that, that we have obligations to one another becomes folks need to take responsibility for themselves once the numbers are revealed about who disproportionately gets sick and dies, right? So a few weeks ago, Adam Sura wrote a lovely piece for The Atlantic. The coronavirus was an emergency until Trump found out who was dying. That's what it's called for those of you who wanna go look that up. In it, he refers to the work of philosopher Charles Mills, um, particularly his book, The Racial Contract, which is probably one of my favorite books if I have any students who are, who are um, watching, they, they know that they've had to read that book several times. So in addition to being a really great contemporary philosopher, right, Mills is also a really great human. And, and those of you who spent significant time around academics know that those two things don't automatically <laughs> track together. But Mills actually has a connection to Toronto. I think he completed his PhD at the University of Toronto. So for Surer, borrowing from Mills, the racial contract is sometimes is the sometimes tacit, often explicit set of governing norms or agreements regarding how society will understand itself. Without going into too much detail, what, what Mills has in mind is the guiding framework for society. So it's similar to how I'm thinking about the polis, who's in, who's out, who matters. And these questions for me undergird who or what constitutes what I'm calling the public we. So lest anyone think that the racial element of the COVID-19 response is anomalous, I want to be clear, right, that one can draw a bright line from the COVID-19 response after the race data became clearer to the other aspects of society in order to figure out who belongs in the polis. So one example I have in mind comes from an article that came out over a decade ago by, I believe, the uh, Pefley and Hurwitz. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing those names correctly, but I'll give you the, the article title is Persuasion and Resistance race and the death penalty in America, for those of you who are interested. So uh, Pefley and Hurwitz used national survey data to gauge Americans' attitudes about the death penalty. It turns out that when white Americans learned that the death penalty discriminated against black people, they became more in favor of it. So Pefley and Hur Hurwitz theorized that this attitude can be largely explained by white associations between blackness and crime. However, if you remember the images of prisoners in New Orleans being left on bridges to die right before Hurricane Katrina made landfall, right? 
And do you see the current response to those who are imprisoned in the midst of this pandemic, right? Being left to die, right? Then you can't explain this fundamental lack of humanity towards a mostly black and brown population just by a mere association between blackness or brownness and criminality. So the other example I wanna highlight just briefly uh, is the differential regard for the wearing of masks in public spaces and how wearing or not wearing those masks is treated. So I, I would show some images, uh, but our technology isn't quite there where, where we get reliable uh, images, but I'm, I'm going to, um, the things I'm gonna to refer to are pretty kind of easy to Google. I'm not referring to, any, I won't refer to anything obscure. So I've seen both still images and cell phone videos, mostly out of New York in recent weeks of police encounters with people who are not wearing masks. It sparked much discussion in, in uh, certain corners of, of social media about the stark differences between how police engage people who are not wearing masks. But one of the most striking videos for me was of a black woman in a New York subway sa station who was wrestled to the ground in front of her child for not wearing a mask. Right, so the other feature of not being part of the polis is the okaying, if you will, of the use of punitive measures to enforce compliance. So do I think that people should wear a mask in public? Yes, <laughs> right, I mean, I'm a bioethicist. I think it's a matter of public health. Uh, my mother's a nurse, right? I think we should be wearing masks in public. But do I think that one ought to be wrestled to the ground for not wearing one or threatened with arrests or prison or jail time? Um, absolutely not. I don't think it's an appropriate response. And I certainly don't think it's an appropriate first response. But we see in some of these videos, it's, it's kind of very quick from kind of initial confrontation to threatened arrest or other kinds of um, physical, physical punitive measures. So contrast this response with the response to those overwhelmingly white spaces where people go without masks due to carelessness, laziness, lack of regard for the seriousness of the pandemic, or frankly, an attitude that only those who are Black, Latinx, or Native American are suffering from this disease, and therefore COVID-19 is nothing to worry about, right? So the local Whole Foods, right, my Whole Foods indeed, is just simply distributing masks, no questions asked, to those who enter the store. So finally, I want to think about the populations of white people springing up who see mask wearing as an infringement on their freedom. It is not accidental that in these images, right, the images of these protests, and I'm going to use that word protest very loosely. We can talk about that in our discussion if y'all want to. Um, one also sees Confederate flags and Ku Klux Klan symbols, right? One image that's gone viral in the past 48 hours or so uh, is that of a white woman, Greta Stinger, holding a sign outside the Humboldt County, California courthouse that reads, muzzles are for dogs and slaves. I am a free human being. Accompanying the verbiage is a photograph of an, of an enslaved Afro-Brazilian woman who's wearing a gag mask and a collar. So, so I think in this image, Stinger is, is truly revealing where she understands her place in the polis, right? That place allows one to assert oneself without fear of reprisal, whether it is on the steps of a courthouse or confronting the mostly black and brown frontline workers who may ask one to wear a mask before entering so-called essential businesses. Understanding that the polis is not a space of equality, right? We have to understand that. Nor does it pretend to be, right? If we understand that, we can explain how, and, and I think the three of us talked about this a, a couple of days ago, this can explain how we see President Trump and Vice President Pence often without masks while everyone around them is wearing a mask, right? It's not a place of equality. It, it, it doesn't pretend to be. So even the idea that we must look out for one another is a false idea from the beginning. The public we obscures the fact that even as we are all in the polis, we are not all in the polis. So I'll stop here for now. But one more thing that may come out in conversation is, some, is how some of these violent encounters between prospective shoppers and security guards who attempt to enforce mask policies have occurred between people of color and, and what bearing that may have on my notion of, of this public we and race, particularly as it relates to COVID. So I'll just stop right here. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Yolanda. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this question of belonging um, and this like question of who is in and who is out is super important. Um, I have a couple kind of like other bits of, of things that I'll save for later that kind of that resonates with just in terms of like news stories and kind of local permutations um, of COVID. Um, 
I am going to talk for a little while um, about a sort of different angle. And so what I want to do is connect some sort of historical investigation I've been doing. And I mean, it's sort of straddling, I guess, the boundaries of history and philosophy insofar as I'm not a historian. Um, and I'm kind of interested, though, in looking to history and kind of historical moments and kind of conceptual schemes um, from, from all epochs to think about sort of like how we should analyze and perhaps even kind of like approach the situation politically. Um, and so I've been looking at instances in the US American 20th century of access to emergency care specifically, um, starting in about the 1910s. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the sorts of patterns um, that I think are kind of revealing about the way in which, first of all, the way in which healthcare is racially unevenly distributed, say. Um, but I think the kind of perhaps if we want to call it a lesson or if we want to call it sort of a prompt um, for thinking about COVID is thinking about the ways in which narratives or stories that are told about racial disparities. And in particular, I'm thinking about the sorts of stories that are used in order to garner political support for addressing racial disparities, the way in which they those play out historically, and in some sense, even though the underlying conditions and mechanisms of discrimination have changed a lot in the past 80 or so years, which is what I'll be looking at first, a lot of the ways in which individual stories are kind of used often very effectively to stand in for kind of um, broader patterns that are perhaps less visible in the Gestalt have remained kind of relatively constant. And I think that those come with political advantages in terms of, you know, most political movements always coalesce around a particular rallying cry or catalyst. Um, and they can also be, um, you know, they can also lead to problems. And I think a lot of people have pointed out the way in which I kind of like over focus on individual cases or kind of um, extraordinary instances of outrageous conduct can end up kind of obscuring more every day and kind of persistent forms of violence that may not be as spectacular. Um, but that contrast, I think, is something that's really important um, in looking at how medical racism is talked about and kind of attempts to, to kind of create, create counter narratives and kind of raise consciousness. Um, and I want to think about the ways in which COVID um, both fits into that history, but also seems to trouble the sort of distinction that I'm going to try to trace. And the first case I want to look at is a case from 1931, um, also in Northern Georgia, um, Georgia obviously being one of the kind of key loci of precisely the kind of um, tensions between, you know, the, the kind of notion of kind of like freedom and personal responsibility with this um, racial and indeed racist undertone. So basically this is a story of a young woman called Juliet Derricott who was the Dean of Women at Fisk University, historically black college in Nashville. And she was a um, fairly kind of well-connected and prominent activist affiliated with the national NAACP and had worked for the um, Young Women's Christian Association in kind of global missionary activity, um, had traveled and spent time in Japan and India, I believe. So anyway, she was a kind of prominent and rising kind of um, educator and activist among the nascent civil rights movement of the 1930s, a fairly good friend and kind of mentee of W.E.B. Du Bois. Anyway, so she was driving um, on a long weekend, I believe, or maybe Thanksgiving even, with three of her students to visit to kind of go to see their respective families in northern Georgia, she's from Athens, um, just across the Georgia state line from Tennessee, they got into a car accident with a white motorist. Um, Derek Hott and another student, Nina Mae Johnson, were very severely injured. Two others were less severely injured and their, their fractures and sprains were set and they were fine. Derek Hott and Johnson, 
um, were initially taken by passing white motorists to the private practice of white doctors um, in downtown Dalton, Georgia, who admitted them to their practice and tried to stabilize them using, um, you know, tried to kind of stabilize their fractures and give them, give them some treatment um, stimulants for, for shock and stuff like that. But when it came time, when it became clear that both would need much more intensive care um, and indeed hospitalization, there was no question they were denied access to the whites only hospital that had been newly constructed in Dalton, Georgia, and instead were taken to the home of a, an elderly African American woman who provided midwife services to the town's black community out of her home and had also occasionally kind of um, whose, whose living room had operated as a makeshift operating theater. Um, for, um, for black residents for use by white doctors. Um, eventually they were then transferred there by segregated ambulance to Chattanooga, Tennessee, um, you know, about an hour, about an hour drive away where both Derek Hott and Johnson died. So, I mean, this story is one that happened many times across the segregated South um, and also many times um, perhaps in less kind of explicit terms in the North and we'll see kind of similar iterations continue to happen. What's remarkable about Derek Cott's story is not so much the kind of details, horrifying as they are, just as COVID, the details of COVID are not so surprising, but the way in which this became taken up as a story and indeed a rallying cry for political organizing. So, this is, of course, in large degree due to Derek Hott's um, large network um, among the national, the NAACP, the Christian Students Movement. Um, so, for example, W.E.B. Du Bois, with whom she had, she had met in New York when she did a master's degree at Columbia, published an extensive dossier in The Crisis, the prominent magazine that he edited on her death, in which he provided an editorial um, and he kind of collated testimony. He actually gathered testimony from a variety, from a number of eyewitnesses, both residents of Dalton, Georgia, but also survivors of the crash and colleagues of Derek Hotz at Fisk um, that really laid out the details of this um, tragedy and kind of used this very consciously as a symbol of the kind of medical discrimination that was happening all over the South. Um, and so this was, you know, very much thought of not just as a kind of individual horrific accident, but as something that was emblematic of a much broader and more pernicious trend. Um, and I think that that case, um, you know, long ago as it was, should have a lot of resonance for thinking about other more recent cases of individual, like kind of truly excruciating and more kind of like obviously criminal forms of neglect that get taken up, um, rightly so, and around which campaigns for reform get constructed. And so, you know, I think that one way to think about it or one kind of metaphor that I've been toying with is a contrast between foreground and background. So in some sense, what um, a kind of like particularly egregious case like Derek Cotts allows um, a thinker like W.E.B. Du Bois to do at the time is to bring this background mundane forms of social control of violence and of the uneven distribution of healthcare and of death. This case kind of crystallizes that into a particular, particularly kind of clear cut form of political and moral violation and it allows those background factors to be brought to the fore. And I think that's a really important, um, I think that's a really important kind of role that these stories play. And I think they continue kind of individual, these individual stories and kind of individual cases um, continue to have that kind of resonance. I mean, I think there, you know, before I turn directly to COVID, I want to know what is kind of at issue with this. So um, staying on the topic of emergency medicine, I wanna kind of relay um, uh, a more anecdotal experience from the mid 2010s at a time when I was involved with an organizing campaign to expand access to emergency medicine or more specifically to trauma care 
on the south side of Chicago, which is of course, um, you know, site of enormous segregation, enormous deprivation of healthcare among, among other things. And I, along with another couple of members of this campaign, both a group of kind of um, white students at an elite university and um, members of a primarily African-American kind of youth group from the South side met with a prominent scholar of African-American politics to both to kind of get some advice and also to get a signature for a petition, one of many petitions. Um, and I think there was this challenge that this, that this professor posed to all of us, which at the time everyone was kind of unimpressed by, but I think in retrospect was meant to be precisely a provocation to grapple with these sorts of questions. And basically the, the kind of question was, you know, yeah, that this story is awful. These stories of people who are in car accidents or subject to gun violence, um, those are horror stories, but the numbers aren't that big. And if you're really interested in improving access to medical or medical care, and fighting medical racism. Why are you focusing on this? Why not diabetes prevention? Why not increasing access to good grocery stores? Why not um, increasing kind of like primary cardiology? And you know, I think that what I mean by saying it's a um, provocation was precisely a kind of prompt to interrogate the ways in which these kind of singular um, singular incidents, whether those are individual cases as in Derricotte's case, or whether they're particular forms of medical inequality end up, if one is not very conscious, end up potentially rather than being kind of like an entry point into broader organizing, end up precisely having the unintentional implication that this is kind of like a singular problem and in some sense all the other stuff is background. And so I think a structurally analogous um, you know, kind of concern that a lot of abolitionist organizers, for example, have is that the focus both on for-profit private prisons and then also and relatedly on so-called nonviolent drug offenders, um, even though that's a way to kind of generate um, public outrage about mass incarceration and indeed to draw in otherwise skeptical liberal audiences as to the importance of fighting mass incarceration, incidentally has the effect um, of setting back organizing if one is not careful to articulate that private prisons and for-profit prisons are a tiny fraction of, um, represent a tiny fraction of the prison population. And similarly to actually engage in a national program of decarceration in the US, focusing only on kind of so-called nonviolent drug offenders is going to be, you know, it's gonna do something, but it's not going to go nearly even close to all the way. And so I think that sort of concern and this need to balance um, those, two, those two things um, is, is a kind of really important lesson. And it's something that we see that kind of tension between foreground and background or between kind of the particular case and the broader forms of less spectacular um, violence and, and kind of unequal distribution of care is something that activists and thinkers are continuing to navigate. Now, how this all ties back to COVID, and this is the sort of more tentative part, but I think that, so in COVID, we've seen reporting um, on racial disparities. And as Yolanda says, none of this is surprising. The numbers that are coming out um, are really not particularly shocking to anyone who has been studying this, but not just people who have been studying this for a long time, like people who have you know, happen to read the occasional reports on it in magazines and newspapers. Um, so, I mean, none of this is shocking. And so we have these statistical patterns, you know, kind of reports on where this is being distributed. And, you know, we do have cases of particularly kind of like egregious forms of medical neglect with COVID, right? So there are cases of doctors simply ignoring the symptoms of Black and Latino patients in New York, we have hospitals that are criminally underfunded. Um, we have high rates of uninsurance. And those are important things to talk about. Those are, of course, like these kind of particularly localizable forms of violation are going to be, you know, those should be reported. I'm certainly not saying they shouldn't, but the sort of massively unequal death that we're seeing across the United States can't all be attributed to those sorts of particularly 
um, striking forms of discrimination. So we're gonna have to look at things like, um, we're gonna have to look at these kind of more diffuse patterns, rates of insurance, um, rates of underinsurance in particular, access to primary care facilities. And then of course, the existence of pre-existing chronic underlying conditions that are produced by precisely those sorts of patterns. Um, and so, I mean, that kind of toggling between background and foreground is gonna be important, but in some sense, I think COVID complicates or even kind of makes, calls into question that very distinction between the individual spectacular case and the sort of background conditions of social inequality, precisely because what we're seeing is very, very rapid, um, very rapidly produced, racially distributed um, mass death that isn't simply a matter of individual malfeasance. So you see precisely the kind of, um, the level of kind of atrocity that you, you see in a case like Derek Potts or a case like um, emergency care in general, that's why it's a particular organizing call, but you also have the importance of putting the structural forces front and center. So I'm gonna leave it there. I mean, this is sort of, um, you know, that's this is a more kind of, um, sketchy connection that I want to draw between this tension in the kind of long 20th century and kind of thinking about the ways in which there are lessons to be learned from that, but also the way in which the current situation um, might prompt a kind of transformation of precisely the patterns that we observe. Okay, so I'm going to stop there and then um, I've talked a bit about history, but Corey is a historian and he's going to give us um, even more kind of proper, proper kind of historical, historical background. And then I see that there are some questions in the YouTube chat, so we'll have those. And you know, as we're talking, feel free to to keep to keep putting those up, and I'll keep monitoring them. Okay, uh, thanks, Marcus, for the venue. Uh, but I'd also like to thank Yolanda. It's been wonderful getting to know you over the past few weeks, and to have this ongoing dialogue. And, and a special thanks to Elena for organizing this and organizing all the other things that you've organized. Um, you kept the conversation alive that I wasn't sure would continue for so long, but it's been very generative and continues. Nice so, too, obviously. Yeah, I can't have. Very much. Um, hopefully I won't talk for uh, too much longer than 10 minutes. Uh, and I hope to be in dialogue with uh, my fellow panelists, but I want to say that some of my remarks are generally going to be on the sort of uh, the history and the prospects the possibility of cross-racial solidarity. So that one of the things that is apparent to me both from our ongoing conversations, but then also sort of my own monitoring of the recent epidemic as someone, pandemic, as someone who's a non-specialist, someone who's a historian, someone who works on literary history, uh, is that we can't solve the current epidemic and the current inequities that are haunting the United States uh, by sort of re relying on these older sort of systems of Jim Crow, right? That uh, we need Americans of all racial backgrounds, all groups to come together to acknowledge each other as humans, as uh, fellow citizens, to be thinking in terms that are not xenophobic, but ones that are inclusive if we are going to find solutions to minimize death, minim minimize suffering, all sorts of uh, questions and tensions and problems, possibilities that uh, need to inform our present and our future. So I want to look at some sort of past examples and read a little bit. I'm even going to read a poem to sort of put some of this in context. I'm going to talk a little bit about Du Bois, but broadly speaking, thinking about this polis. So I'll start off talking about the hospitals a little bit and then segue into thinking about how Du Bois has thought about some of these things historically. So this is a contentious argument uh, for some people, but I firmly believe that there's nothing foregone about racial inequality. So uh, in my own work, uh, my own research, contingency and contingencies are crucial for understanding the past and for considering how they may inform the world that we inhabit. So to give you one example of this from the 19th century, and I'll come back to the 19th century again. Uh, in the 19th century, it was the Irish who were regularly, consistently faulted for cholera outbreaks in New York City and cities all across the East Coast, right? So that the ways that race and racialization functions changes very dramatically 
between the 19th and the 20th centuries. And if there are even some particulars that are important for uh, honing in on, bearing out, thinking about as we continue this conversation. But even just that is a mark for me of why contingency is important and thinking about how it bears on uh, health and race and all sorts of other matters. So the United States is a fragmented healthcare system. This is no surprise. Uh, it's under tremendous stress right now. According to the New York Times, uh, in the past 15 years, approximately 170 rural hospitals have closed, to just give you one dramatic statistic. Uh, that's not much if you consider that the US has a little bit over 6,000 hospitals. But one of the things that's a problem is that there are massive inequities in how uh, much cash these places have. So countless accounts recently talked about the dire need for cash infusion for American hospitals. And uh, that's not actually going to be allocated based on current need. That's just one sort of glimpse into inequities that uh, we'll be grappling with in the coming months. And of course, in the coming years, if more hospitals continue to close. One of the things that I've looked at with Elena over the past few years is the ways that a lot of these disparities are embedded into the actual development of the American healthcare system, and in particular, the development and the infrastructure that go, the finances that goes into American hospitals, right? In our case, we looked at that uh, in the development of the University of Chicago's Medical Center in the early 20th century. Uh, this is a privatized system, it's, it's segmented, uh, it operates on a competitive business model. This is something that stretches back to the late 19th century, so there's nothing distinctive about that in terms of it being something that's particular to the present, but something that goes way back to the past. Free enterprise as an ideological commitment uh, clearly informs our present. In a draft of a speech titled Social Medicine, delivered to the College of Medicine at the University of Illinois in 1950, W.E.B. Uh, e. Du Bois uh, summarizes a paradigm that eerily anticipates our present. So I'm gonna read from the speech that he gave at University of Illinois in 1950. This is W.E. Du Bois. Freedom, the American way of life, private initiative, free enterprise, and democracy are the slogans and catchwords which are in familiar and constant use today. They appear axiomatic and self-interpreting at first sight. We want to be free. We want to go where we please, when we please, and do what we please. We do not live to have policemen ordering us about or chairmen stopping us from talking or governments loading us with laws. We want the right to make our own plans, plan our own lives and set our own goals. We want all avenues of advancement and accomplishment open to us and kept open. We want a voice in our own government we want to elect officials whom we favor, and when uh, and we want the way, we want uh, the way kept open to Congress and the presidency. This is the American way of life. The difficulty with it is that it's not true, and cannot be true. And the sooner we face the facts that we already know, the sooner we will talk like rational human beings and not like fools. Unquote. This really speaks to me because of so many different resonances that it has with the present in terms of uh, questions around free enterprise, questions around uh, the American way of life and the, the fictions that we tell ourselves, most, most, uh, most importantly for me. Du Bois lamented the fact of the lack of coordinated medicine in the United States when he was giving this talk in 1950, uh, which then, as is the case now, required a high degree of individual and corporate responsibility. As if not more important in what might be best paraphrased as the fiction Americans tell themselves about how free enterprise uh, functions and how business uh, functions in front of the government. In the 21st century, the federal state pays over 50% of healthcare in the United States in the form of like, for example, Medicare and Medicaid. Yet there are 25 million Americans who have no insurance whatsoever to give some sense of just how fictitious uh, the current system is. In 1950, Du Bois urged, what we, have, uh, what we have to go and accomplish through democracy is a better state. And that state has to go organize the demand for public service. 
not only in health, but in procuring of justice and the teaching in our schools, in our literature and art and so on, right? That he thought about this in very capacious, comprehensive terms in terms of what kinds of ways that we needed to come together. Now from here on out, I'm just gonna hone in on ways that he was informed by one of his most important mentors at uh, Harvard College and after Harvard College, William James, a philosopher. So I hate to be treading on the, the shoes of the philosophers here, but one of the things that's so uh, striking to me about William James, who, whose own family comes from an Irish American background, his grandfather was a second generation Irish immigrant, it really informed the ways that he actually brokered connections with black students, with Jewish students, with queer students like Gertrude Stein, W.B. Du Bois, Alan Locke, and the list goes on. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read a poem that one of his black students wrote him, uh, who he was very close to in the 1890s. 85 years earlier before Du Bois' speech in 1865, uh, Du Bois' most influential professor at Harvard, William James, was gathering his thoughts on related ideas uh, a year after enrolling in Harvard Medical School, uh, training as a doctor. He wrote his parents home that, uh, that year, almost everyone here is a Negro or a Negress, which words I perceive we don't know the meaning of, unquote. And that what he was saying is that the ways that we racialize persons is something that we don't even properly comprehend, right? So that uh, he was traveling in Brazil with Louis Agassiz, who is a, a infamous racist who's promoting notions of polygenesis rather than monogenesis. So the idea that we come from different uh, sort of branches of uh, biological branches rather than from the same one, right? So that he's challenging the person that he is traveling with uh, in a very respectful way and that he doesn't call uh, Louis, Louis Agassiz out on this, on this trip in Brazil, but that he's thinking out loud, right? These are the kinds of things that are gonna go into him brokering uh, connections with black, Jewish, and queer students at Harvard as just one example. So that one of the ways to uh, understand how much in, this was important to Du Bois when he was a student, he talked about it for decades uh, to give a couple quotes he says that uh, Du Bois, like he, when he arrived at Harvard, he uh, was fortunate enough to land squarely in the arms of William James, uh, for which God be praised, unquote. Another quote he gives, he says, uh, quote, I was repeatedly a guest in the home of William James. He was my friend and guide to clear thinking, unquote. Uh, to give you one more uh, example of uh, a black student who's thinking about this and thinking about how William James taught him to think while he was a student at Harvard. This is To William James by Leslie Pinckney Hill. Uh, he included it in a book of sonnets titled The Wings of Oppression in 1921. To William James, I don't read poetry. Devotedly, he watched the silent stream of consciousness and from the shifting brink. In lucid phrase taught thousands how to think. No straightened logic's thrall, he prized the gleam of truth in all experience, the dream. To him was precious too. He dared to link reality with wonder and to sink the plumb of thought down where all mysteries teem. Where is the light we know upon his face, the zest for knowledge searching and intense, gone out for A in darkness deep and strange? Or do they now at last find scope and place uh, where Thales still propounds the elements in her, uh, Heraclitus broods, tis only change. So I'm gonna stop um, here as a provocation. It's powerful to me what it would mean to teach people how to think, to teach people how to think both scientifically, philosophically, artistically, linguistically, all of these things seem to bear some interconnections that Du Bois was certainly picking up decades later when he's talking about social medicine in Chicago, that those roots uh, lay with someone who also was expansive in his own thinking, his own mentorship, his own care and regard for people in his community. I think that there are lessons that we can take from that. Uh, to give one example, Gertrude Sainz Melancta, a novella link story at the uh, center of her first novel to go back to the ancients, uh, the Melancta 
character is based on at least like it references Melantho from uh, the Odyssey, uh, marginal character, but someone who's certainly important. But that the characters at the center of that novella length love story of two uh, black people are a doctor and a nurse. And they deliver babies in a black neighborhood in Baltimore, which is something that do, uh, William James encouraged Gertrude Stein to do at John Hopkins, right? So that she's doing this work and she's writing about it. The story is rarely thought about in those terms. We think about all sorts of other ways that the story is problematic, the ways that it might be powerful or innovative, but we don't think about the ways that medicine bears on and informs these stories to sort of go to a point that a number of people who do medical history talk about these days. This is a time for us to go back and read critically and think about the ways that medicine bears on our past uh, and how it might inform our future. Thank you. Sorry, I'm just unmuting myself. Um, thank you so much, Corey. So yeah, we have a bunch of questions in the YouTube channel, but before I go to those, and I'll, I'll just kind of choose some as, as seems kind of like most conducive to the flow of the conversation. Um, yeah, I just wanna give each of you, and I guess maybe myself, a chance to jump in if there's anything that kind of stands out as particularly kind of like important for, for building some discussion. Um, going forward, or anything you'd like to talk about that just didn't get, didn't get, didn't get touched on. I can wait till our discussion. Okay. Okay. Discussion. Okay. So should I just? I mean, so a couple. Um, you know, there, there's a bunch of different questions, um, and some of them are more kind of technical or epidemiological, and you know, I don't. And I'm not sure if I'm qualified, but maybe can, you know, we, can, we can kind of at least make some broad comments. Um, I know there are two questions here, one of which said quite, you know, asked, um, said, quote, Ontario and Quebec now collect racial data on COVID-19 cases most Canadian provinces do not. How do we influence the Canadian federal government to collect racial data on COVID cases across Canada? And then another question um, from a journalist um, who said simply too much emphasis on US, we need to know relevance in Canada. I'm a white journalist reporting on clinical medicine and aware of social determinants of health, but not specifically here. So, you know, I think that all three of us sort of acknowledge um, our, you know, US centricness. I mean, I think both y Yolanda said so explicitly, and I certainly think of this as something of a blind spot in my own work, just on the basis of this is sort of you know, that's what I know, but I also think that there is an importance given that we are, um, you know, on a ostensibly Canadian platform, even if we're not physically there, to kind of think about what what sorts of lessons um, there are. I mean, just on the first point, I know that Manitoba started collecting race, race, racial breakdowns of COVID cases um, and publicizing those. And I mean, the real, I mean, one real question, and I mean, lesson for Canada is that there's a very different um, you know, there's two questions, one of which is the sorts of patterns that are emerging in the US and to what extent those are emerging here and what are the sort of similar, um, you know, what sorts of similar dynamics um, are playing out. But then of course, it's hard to even, you know, we know that very similar kind of medical inequalities exist in Canada as they do in most countries with racial stratification and hierarchies perhaps all, I mean, that's probably one of the kind of key aspects of a racial, of a racially hierarchical society. But in Canada, there hasn't been any kind of like centralized or comprehensive data collected specifically on COVID. So, you know, the question of kind of like actually creating a more kind of um, concrete response um, in terms of addressing those racial inequalities um, is at a kind of perhaps even, even kind of earlier stage. Um, but you know, one expects it's similar based on previous pre previous trends um, in in kind of um, particularly in in Black Canadians um, and in Indigenous groups that kind of patterns that are not dissimilar from the U.S. would hold. I mean, I think that one, um, you know, Canada's outbreaks um, in Quebec have been fairly severe, but Canada has managed to escape at least the worst of the U.S. style outbreaks, at least temporarily. But that, of course, is not guaranteed. And so, you know, one reason that looking at the U.S. might be helpful is precisely to see 
what are the kind of particular weak points of an already weak public health system and to kind of like try to get ahead of those. So, I mean, for example, the spread of COVID um, in indigenous communities in the US, both on and off reservations, seems like, you know, even though similar outbreaks have not been reported in Canada, I mean, that would be a place to kind of like put particular attention given previous patterns of um, medical, severe medical neglect um, in Canada, just as in the US. So, I mean, that's just on the Canadian question. I mean, one other question I think that maybe to kind of go back to Yolanda's portion to kind of to, to circle back on the discussion, um, this, this person wrote, um, hate to resort to an internet meme, but initially the weeness of the pandemic um, was expressed as we're all in the same boats and it changed to we're in the same storm, but in different boats. And I mean, I suppose that seems like a, a one kind of good way to return to this question of community and who was kind of included within the political sphere of concern in this very urgent moment. Um, in a kind of storm. And I mean, of course, like what, you know, then the natural questions are what sorts of boats are we all in? Are all those boats, you know, kind of like seaworthy? Um, are there enough life jackets on all the boats? Whatever, right? I mean, we can sort of extend that kind of perhaps somewhat simplistic metaphor, but I think it's, I think it's worth going back to. I mean, one thing that I was thinking, Yolanda, as you were talking is this article. So there was this long article in the Washington Post that was just kind of interviews with, you know, kind of like, upper middle class and wealthy Georgia residents at a kind of shopping complex, some kind of like gated community shopping complex, um, you know, north of Atlanta. And basically, you know, they were talking about how excited they were to get back in stores and get their nails done, whatever, right? And it was very much kind of like not a piece of analysis. It was just kind of like long form reporting, but very effective for that. I mean, one really telling piece was a man who, you know, said, oh, you know, like initially I was anxious, but then I saw where the, what the demographic trends are and I'm not so concerned anymore. And of course, you know, like how one hears that, whether there's a kind of like, he by that he means explicitly racial demographics, I think is sort of besides the point, because even if, you know, what is more consciously meant is something like, well, you know, it's happening in, in the cities, the way that urban and suburban space is constructed in America means that that is precisely tied to questions of race. And I mean, I think that's something you were saying, the way in which the kind of the, the polis, both in the kind of like ancient Greek sense and then in your kind of the way you, you took it up is kind of intimately connected to a kind of like geographical unity, but is also kind of not, not just the same as that, right? But these geographical lines, literally and figuratively, um, are more than just kind of like, I'm far away from it, but it's who is, who is there. Um, and like, is it in other suburbs similar to, to this one and things like that. So, I mean, yeah, I think that going, I mean, just kind of to throwing those two things out there, I'm curious to hear how that, how that connects with what you've been thinking. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So first of all, never apologize for using internet memes. Internet <laughs> memes can be, are great. So let's just, we'll just put that out there. Um, the boat metaphor, right? So, so what popped into my mind was that scene in Titanic where, God, that was a, it's an old movie and God, that movie was a long movie, but, but there's this scene, right, where the first class passengers, of course, get the first crack at the lifeboats. And, and one woman, before she got on the, on the boat, she asks um, one of the, one of the ship employees, uh, are we going to have to be on the boat with people who aren't in first class, right? I mean, she's deeply concerned about this as the ship is going down, that she not die among the unwashed masses, I suppose. Um, and so, you know, even if, so if we take up this notion of, of different boats, right? I mean, I, th I think that's potentially interesting. Uh, I'm not in, I, I would say sometimes I'm not even sure we're in the same storm though. I mean, I, right? I mean, even that kind of assumes a level of commonality that, um, depending on where you are in some of these really um, hard hit spaces, it, it, your life just looks very different. And I don't just mean kind of an individual day to day life, I mean, just kind of the habitats of the community just looks very different. And so, for instance, um, Corey and Elena mentioned rural spaces and what that looks like. So um, for instance, the New York Times published this 
map several weeks back about, you know, where Americans didn't stop traveling. And, and I kind of posted angrily on Facebook and my mother chastised me because there was an F-bomb or two in there um, <laughs> with regard to that. But, but one thing that I, I noticed and one thing that I, that I argued in, in my little kind of angry rapid Facebook post was, you know, people, these people who are writing and, and for the New York Times, they don't seem to have any kind of understanding of how rural people actually live. And so, you know, the New York Times just kind of arbitrarily picked two miles, right? Who's going more than a two mile radius after the lockdown, which doesn't really account for, particularly in rural spaces, right, where you might have to go five or six miles for a grocery store. And so, you know, what the New York Times is assuming is non-essential travel or just people cavalierly kicking up their heels and running all over the country may not be that. And if you don't have an understanding of the places and the people you're writing about, then you end up saying really stupid things and publishing really ridiculous maps like that map that was in the New York Times, right? Um, I don't know if that answered the question about the boat. Oh yeah, yeah. So, so that was me just saying we might be in in very different storms. Mm -hmm. What? It, why does it matter? Well, because what looks like non-compliance, what looks like oh those people don't even care enough to stay home, therefore they sometimes turns into and therefore they deserve whatever happens to them, right? Getting sick, dying, not having hospitals, uh, becomes uh, it, it becomes very easy to kind of draw that line from, oh, those people aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing to therefore anything should happen to them without, without a full appreciation for particularly in rural spaces and even in some urban spaces, right? You might be miles, you might live in a city like New York or Chicago and be, and still be a long way away from a grocery store that would provide you with all of your needs, right? I mean, you might have smaller bodegas or something like that, but but to have kind of a, access to a bigger store. So, so, so that's one thing that that matters to me in terms of the kind of we're in the same storm, but we're in different different boat sensibility. Um, we might not be in the same storm, but we are definitely in, in in different boats. And I just think about you know that image of the woman in the in the Titanic, who's like, or you know, am I going to have to be on this? am I going to have to share a life raft with someone who's poor? And, and this woman, and I, and I wish I could remember the scene. Clearly it's near the end after the, the Titanic has hit the iceberg, but the ship is literally going down and this is what she's preoccupied with. And I think um, the other thing that's kind of telling about that moment is the assumption. And I think this is where kind of Corey's work becomes really interesting. The assumption that we're automatically just going to all pull together. And I don't think that that's, that's true without doing some kind of intentional work in community building, which is also why my kind of notion of this public we, um, why I think that that doesn't quite get us what we what we need what we what we need. Yeah, I mean, I think that your the point about not being necessarily even all in the same storm is very well taken. And, you know, you even look at somewhere like New York, which is, you know, obviously a highly localized epidemic within the pandemic. And you see that, like, the places where there are the most cases, but also the highest death rates are vastly uneven between parts of the city, right? So, I mean, the question of whether it makes sense to say that, like, Elmhurst, Queens and Manhattan are in the same storm, I think, is itself it's all somewhat dubious, right? And so, I mean, what, um, you know, what what the kind of, um, the question of like, what sort of, um, what what kind of like, what that metaphor implies about, about commonality, um, you know, I think it, I think it, I think it does get at something, right? And I think part of what it gets at is that it's used. I mean, when you say the rhetoric of saying, we're all in the same boat, that's a way of kind of invoking a, collective action that we need to pull together and do something about it, right? And to say that we're in different boats is to say that that kind of like breaks down. Um, and I suppose the question is like, what if we're not all in the same boat and aren't perhaps even all in the same storm, precisely like what collective action would look like, right? And like what, what solidarity might look like even when, you know, like it's not the health, um, you know, it's not kind of like, my health at risk when it's someone 
far away, right? And so it's not just a matter of saying, well, you know, like, I'm wearing, I'm wearing a mask to protect others. I mean, that's fine, that's good and important, but it's also, I mean, the real, the real like harms are happening in very localized ways, right? So thinking about not beyond just this kind of like individual acts of solidarity with your neighbors, you have to think about what an act of solidarity with people that one might not even see. Right. And so like how those how those coalitions, what Corey was talking about, can be built also in the absence of physical presence, right? Like what does organizing look like when one can't meet face to face? Like you can't come together for a demonstration unless you're like an anti-lockdown protester. Sorry, Sorry for that. It's very important for the trauma center and at the University of Chicago, right? That after several years of organizing both like university students who are coming from like relatively elite background, working across uh, class lines, community lines, racial lines, to actually forge some kind of political movement together that actually then like generates a trauma center, which is clearly like in like critical use to this day, right? That a lot of the capacity that the University of Chicago is congratulating itself on has direct bearing on the fact that you've actually helped build that trauma center, right? That that wasn't something, again, like to sort of think about like the ways that sort of like action function that it wasn't inevitable that they were going to open up this $40 million facility. But you see a lot of institutions, most notably uh, the recent case with the University of Pennsylvania opening a uh, $500 million wing of its own hospital that's now become like a very important resource uh, in Philadelphia, there's nothing inevitable about that being a resource for people that are suffering, like who are like low income, who might even be exposed to COVID, right? That the ways that we relate to like the specificity actually matters. I, I think it also in some ways is a provocation to sort of even think about the ways that we privilege data, right? That what does it do if I can read the New York Times every day and see these, you know, egregious, like heartbreaking statistics about ways that black and brown people are disproportionately affected by COVID if I just go back to drinking my, la my latte and like reading my books, you know? That in some ways it is a call to sort of like think about like A, like what are like institutional possibilities uh, if you're thinking about sort of like, you know, states, organizations, if there's something that you can be done, that can be done at the local level, if there's something to be done in your block, right? That these are the kinds of things that people also need to be asking themselves uh, in the face of these inequitable systems, I would argue. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, I just want to pick up on, I mean, I think I, I agree with everything you said. And I mean, this question, I mean, the sorts of examples of kind of coalition building that you raised, I think are really important. And then, I mean, the question is what lessons can be learned from that and how to translate those into a context where at least for the moment one actually can't get together and like talk. And I think that that kind of like physical space being made has historically been really important for developing those sorts of, those sorts of alliances. Um, I just wanna pick up on something that you said, Corey, um, about data and sort of like, what are the uses of data, which obviously we've talked a little bit about, um, you know, Yolanda Open with talking about the importance of gathering this data and being able to observe these patterns. We talked a little bit about the Canadian data, but I think something you said and the way in which it can kind of both, you know, kind of like fail to move when you can go back to your latte, but also I think even more worryingly perhaps have a kind of numbing quality that it becomes, it becomes a little bit kind of just, it, it becomes an abstraction at some level. Um, I mean, there's a couple of questions. I mean, I think both of those are really important. There's a couple of questions in the YouTube stream about, about roughly speaking data collection. So I just thought I'd throw those out there. And obviously none of us are really kind of like, well, I don't know, at least I'm not. I, I just want to say one more thing before we yeah, move on. This, sure. is, this is precisely what Agassiz was doing in Brazil, right? That he's accumulating data uh -huh. to verify racist science, to right. verify racist difference. And so right. that one of the things that he's coming across or coming up to with someone, you know, William James who's going to be one of the sort of, you know, preeminent figures of pragmatism is someone who's questioning just how verifiable this data is. Yeah, that I mean. That is from a sort of like verifying difference, in fact, is unfounded in terms of sort of like understanding like how like people like 
how biology functions, sort of how racial, like race and racialization and hierarchies function. And so there really is something to be cautious about in terms of like how we want to document and how we want to assess and how that drives our own motivations. Right. Sorry. I mean, even if it, even when and if the data is verifiable, I mean, perfectly objective, I mean, what one makes of that, right? I'm like, so data collection doesn't happen. I mean, I think this is sort of, you know, to people who do kind of critical studies of medicine and science, this would be kind of an obvious point, but, you know, data collection doesn't happen in a kind of like standpoint neutral manner, right? And like how that data um, is deployed has an effect on what is collected. And I mean, kind of like, talking about numbers independently of thinking about what one is kind of doing with them and what one is putting them in the service of, I think is a big mistake, right? So I mean like- I one little thing about the, yeah. Yeah, um, but I mean, sorry, go ahead. Oh no, I was, I'm just sitting here gesturing, right? And gesticulating. <laughs> um, one thing that I also think about with, with the data conversation is, you know, we're three humanists, right? right. Sitting here. And I think that there's, um, I think sometimes those of us, and, and I'll, I'll include myself in this, who do kind of bioethics or think about medical history, right? We think it's important that we we can read data to prove to the medical people that we deserve to be on the stage too. But I think we also um, have to think about the tools that we have and the spaces, um, in the spaces where we are and the kind of work that we do, right? Creating narrative, understanding narrative, understanding literature, right? That these all become equally important and depending on what communities you find yourself in, right, might be more valuable to communities in which you move and you're thinking about these kinds of issues. And so, you know, I think you're right, Corey, that sometimes we do kind of, I think data is important. I mean, I wouldn't have opened my talk without thinking about what these numbers look like and, and getting clear about the numbers. I also think that narrative and story and storytelling and appreciating history and art and music can also give us um, a, a very different entree point into some of these conversations, particularly about COVID and about health disparities. And particularly if we're in um, other, other, in all kinds of communities where you know, that may not be, um, you know, gatherings of epidemiologists, right? Yeah, yeah, no, I think I think that's all well taken. Um, just so just throwing out a couple of kind of like concerns about data. And I mean, I don't think any of us will have like answers about the actual data or how it should be collected, but just sort of thinking, you know, more broadly about what sorts of data should be collected and what sort of concerns should be raised, right? So I mean, if, a couple of things. So one, one of which is, um, you know, how to design treatment and testing. And I think testing is this real kind of has become this real kind of uh, you know, treatment, there's this question, you know, literally it's just like more beds, um, better access to doctors. I mean, that's sort of like, in some sense, I think maybe the easier question, testing the two questions that I mean, I think are related are testing and contact tracing. So the first question on testing is how to design testing to include a minimum equal and at best a disproportional number of racialized people are included. And then on contact tracing, um, does either human or automated contact tracing have built in racial, gender, class bias issues that we should be aware of? Um, you know, I think this, this, there's questions about the kind of like racial, class, gender, et cetera, biases of lots of kind of like automated algorithmic systems. Um, and the, those are probably salient here about which I'm not super um, knowledgeable. But I mean, I think those sorts of questions um, you know, yes, there's a question of like literally talking about like how data is designed on those things should work, but then also like the sorts of broader concerns I think are very salient when kind of the interface between data and and kind of like, you know, genuine kind of like questions of political distribution and power. Um, let me see, is there other, are there other data questions? Oh yeah, it's also this question, it's hard to separate, but is this also an issue of class or income? Um, and you know, there it seems like yes, it's probably a yes and question as it always is. Um, and then about gender, um, what about gender, especially as women make up a larger proportion of the service industry and of course of medical workers, I would imagine too. So I mean, those I think, um, you know, I don't, I don't have super much to say about the details of those, but those seem like precisely the sorts of questions, critical questions about data collection that should be being asked, but I'll just put those on the table too. No, I think that uh, I didn't, say too much about Gertrude Stein. Gertrude Stein is a very complicated 
figure in her own right because she's so self, she contradicts herself so much that she never walks away. She sort of in, uh, she sort of leaves herself looking really bad <laughs> uh, in short so that she's never coherent. I mean, I think that in some ways her incoherence is uh, intentional so that you can't legibly sort of follow her train of thought in terms of what she thinks on uh, social issues or sort of civics or politics. But, you know, one of the things that really ends up breaking her heart, I mean, William James teaches at the, what is then the Harvard Annex when she's a student there. That's how they got to know one another. Uh, it wasn't obligatory for him to teach at the Harvard Annex to teach women who were enrolled at that college. He did it because he felt that women needed and deserved the same education and training that men did when Harvard College didn't admit female students to that institution, right? Uh, John Hopkins University, which remains a very, very important institution for both like US and global medicine was uh, endowed by women who demanded that women have the same right to medical education as men did upon that institution being founded. In practice, that was not equitable at all for women. Uh, Gertrude Stein's male classmates treated her with such disrespect that in her fourth year of uh, med medical school, she basically just dropped out. She basically just stopped doing it, right? So that uh, the ways that she was encouraged by William James, for instance, to go to medical school, to get have some applied training, the same ways that he encouraged uh, du Bois actually to do something applied actually in, in both cases for them to not be philosophers, uh, but, but y'all are all wonderful. Uh, and then to be thwarted, right? To be thwarted by gender bias. That I think that for me, like certainly like there are pressing matters to sort of deal with and adjudicate in the present in terms of how these things actually function. But this is another area I think, especially with medical training we're looking not only at how uh, you know, many people of color are being trained as doctors, right? Like to, to think about the ways that sort of exclusionary, exclusion is built into the system, is built into design in part from homogenous uh, professional populations doing the work, right? That if you have a more inclusive uh, community of people who are designing tracking systems, who are, who are on the staffs of hospitals, uh, you arguably have like much less of bias built into a system. Uh, that's historically affected people of color um, almost as much as it's affected women, right? And then of course there are intersectional ways that these things coalesce as well that need to be taken into consideration. So one worry that I have about, about data collection, and so, you know, I think it's important to, to collect it at the same time, well, two worries really, um, are privacy and stigma. And I don't know if this, this fully answers a kind of bias question, um, but, but there's certainly kind of concerns that come out in, in my own work elsewhere where, um, you know, being COVID positive, what is that going to mean and how is that going to look in different communities? So, you know, Elena mentioned how, you know, I, I, recent immigrants, recent Irish immigrants were often, um, you know, cast as, as the vectors of cholera in various parts, um, in various cities in, in U.S. history. And I'm just kind of thinking about the ways that um, contagion also track race and class. And so I think that that's one worry that I have or one concern that I have in terms of the ethics of, of data collection. Um, also, uh, the privacy versus the publicness of, of data. So what do I mean by that? Well, I think that uh, particularly in, in the US, again, Canada is gonna look different here, but you know, those who rely on kind of the public, I'll loosely say for their healthcare. So the county health department, for example, uh, find that they often have less privacy around their health care their health choices, their health status. And, you know, what is that going to look like? You know, we want the numbers to be representative. We want the numbers to be inclusive and accurate to give us a certain kind of picture. 
but I would be very concerned about ensuring that particularly um, people who rely on the county, for example, uh, for for healthcare and treatment and concerns to to be taken care of in a in a different kind of way. So those of us who have private insurance often, without even thinking about it, or some of us don't even realize that um, our healthcare, our the consequences of us accessing healthcare are different for us than they are for for others. Um, Dorothy Roberts has written on this a lot in um, Killing the Black Body, where she talks about um, drug use, prenatal drug use, for example, and how those who end up going to county hospital for labor and delivery are more likely to be reported than those who have private OBGYNs who, who do their delivery. Um, right. Testing rates, et cetera, all those things become disproportionate. So those are just some, some concerns that I have about, or some things that I think we need to think about and care about in, in how research, how data collection gets designed, um, if this is going to be an important aspect of dealing with COVID-19. Yeah, I mean, I think that what you just, the two, the two issues you brought up about both stigma and, um, sorry, stigma and privacy with regard to COVID status, I mean, you know, I think I would add to that the kind of threat, and, you know, this is, this is a little bit more speculative, but I think that given what we've seen about the use of policing, arrests, violence in order to enforce social distancing. I mean, I think being cognizant of the possibility that COVID, like seropositivity for COVID um, may be criminalized um, in one form or another. I mean, the lessons from HIV criminalization and the way in which HIV status has acquired kind of like social stigma, of course, but has also kind of like become um, a site for criminalization and that criminalization tends to be of, of course, like particular, like already stigmatized, it gets already stigmatized groups of people who are HIV positive who end up getting prosecuted under, under HIV um, criminalization statutes. And I think that kind of like being aware of the possibility that kind of like similar techniques of state power in terms of privacy stigma and then then literal literal repression or criminalization um, should be should be something to be kind of like watching out for I guess as we go forward particularly if this is you know as increasingly being clear like you know if we're talking about like right now like no one has the kind of like we don't have these immunity passports yet right but like the question of, you know, like if we're going to be living with some form of this pandemic for the next like 18 months, two years, whatever, which is what they're now saying, like that is enough time for these very kind of like much more elaborate regimes mm -hmm. of control and surveillance to, mm -hmm. to be kind of constructed. Um, we don't have much more time, but I just want to, there were, you know, just as I think that we've been kind of prompted to, you know, like I guess at least acknowledge our US centricness and kind of thinking about the Canadian context, there were two two comments on the on the on the YouTube thread about um, countries outside of North America, both in the kind of like, you know, so called and, you know, somewhat useless term global south, um, which, you know, I think has, it hasn't had this sort of scale of outbreaks yet, but what we're seeing in Brazil, and then in Russia, which is, you know, kind of a the so-called historically the second world, whatever, um, you know, we're seeing now a shift away from the US in terms of where COVID is, is spreading most rapidly. So the first of those is talking about a recent demonstration in Santiago in Chile. Um, the, yesterday, the word hunger was pro projected as a form of protest in one of the most famous buildings in Santiago. Then some others said the word should be solidarity, but that word emphasizes the difference between us and them. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the, the comment is drawing attention to the kind of same way that this this kind of sense of who is in and who is out and who is kind of like acting where, where there's a kind of collective self-interest and when there's kind of a need to recognize differences and interests and nonetheless figure out ways to act in solidarity is playing out not just in the US but in in other global contexts and I think that just like a throw that out there to be aware of it um the other comment um, is uh, with regard to the situation in India, more specifically, um, socialist, so uh, I'm thinking of socialist landscapes like Kerala um, in South India, and I'm wondering if there's anything we can learn from them with respect to how they have managed the number of cases and deaths. And here, 
I have to admit my own ignorance about what's going on in Kerala specifically, but I think that's um, may have very important lessons. I mean, based on previous um, previous studies and outcomes of kind of development projects in Kerala with what's possible to um, achieve with relatively, you know, in global terms, very, very few resources or capital, but nonetheless to achieve high levels of health outcomes. I mean, the other kind of classic example, I mean, I guess Kerala and Cuba would be the two examples. And I mean, Cuba, you know, has also, of course, they have the luxury of being an island. Um, you know, looking at Kerala would also be really fascinating within the Indian context, because of course, the central government in India has imposed an incredibly harsh lockdown um, starting in mid to late March, and it's just been extended by a couple of weeks, um, which hasn't, doesn't really seem to have, it's definitely slowed the spread of the virus, but it's come at an enormous toll and, you know, the stories of, of migrants trapped um, walking, walking across northern India have been really horrifying in terms of looking at the ways in which the virus not only ends up ignoring, um, but also kind of like exacerbating pre-existent forms of social inequality. But I think that looking at kind of like other more kind of like state level, state level responses within, you know, it's, I guess it's an interesting, it's also an interesting case study within a federal system of how a kind of local or a kind of um, sub, sub federal entity can kind of try to create, create strategies despite the inadequacy of the, of the higher level federal strategies. So, I mean, that's sort of the first thing. Yeah, we can I mean, this is happening, like this is happening in the US, right? That right. distinctive outcomes in Georgia, Louisiana, New York State, the states of Illinois, comparing that to health care, for instance, right? That there are certain parallels that actually can be taken away in terms of thinking about sort of the ways that a federal state does and does not function in that. Uh -huh. Those specificities, I think, especially thinking about someone like Kerala and thinking about India, is very generative, right? That uh -huh. it is going to make a big difference, like how people are managing things locally. That we, especially in the us in the United States, that we would be, um, I guess, sort of negligent if we were just relying on the federal state to sort of consider, adjudicate, and take action on the ways that uh, inequities function. Right, that clearly uh, we can't just rely on the federal government as a means of uh, ameliorating some of these problems or as a means of taking care of people uh, that we are actually sort of much closer to. Yeah, um, I think we're basically we're basically at our time. Do you have any final yeah. final remarks, Yolanda? No, I just thank you, thank you both for this amazing discussion. I hope that those who are viewing found something interesting in, in what we had to say. And so yeah, me too. Yeah, I mean, I'll I just keep working together. Yeah. yeah, I'm really excited. Thank you. Thank you both of you guys so much. This was super, super, um, super provocative and stimulating. Um, and yeah, thank you to everyone who tuned in to watch. Um, I believe Marcus said earlier that this is the 15th session in the Center for Ethics um, COVID related series. And I believe there are more to come. Um, there are archives of the previous ones on the YouTube channel that you're on now. This will be archived there. So anyway, yeah, um, there's there's a lot there's a lot going on. I'll also post some links to 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 some of the articles and resources that we discussed um, over the last over the last hour and a half in the comments on YouTube too. Okay. Anyway, thank you so much, and yeah, have a good afternoon. Thanks. Bye. Bye.